I'm Ian Knowles. I'm an iconographer based in England. I was the founder of the Icon School in Bethlehem, and now I'm back in England. And I've convened this group together to talk about influences and challenges for iconography developing today. So, Aidan, would you like to introduce yourself, and then Stefan, and then Peter? Uh, I started uh, iconography in 1983, having become orthodox. Before that, I was a sculptor, um, and since then I've been involved in other medium as well, uh, fresco, carving, mosaic, etc. I started the three-year part-time uh, icon course at the Princess School of Traditional Arts. And I have two people I've trained working with me as assistants and colleagues at the moment, so the, the training continues. Thank you, Aidan. Thanks very much. Stefan? Well... My name is Stefan René, and um, I've been working in iconography since about 1982. And um, I'm a disciple of Isaac Fanous, who, is, who was the founder of the Neocoptic School of Iconography in Cairo. I did uh, my PhD research in Coptic iconography at the Royal College of Art. And since I've been practicing mainly working for Coptic Orthodox churches uh, in Europe and, uh, and the US mainly. Um, and, and I supervise doctoral research in iconography uh, at the Prince's School of Traditional Arts uh, in London. And I did, I did teach a few courses over the years, but uh, Coptic iconography being what it is, it is not as, it is not as um, well known uh, as say Byzantine iconography. So um, I, uh, I decided to stop that for, for now. And, um, yeah, I'm just practicing as an iconographer, basically. That, that, is, my main, that is my main occupation. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Stefan. Peter. Um, I'm Peter Murphy. I'm a, a, a British iconographer based in Kent. Um, I first started studying icons with uh, Guillaume Ramos Pocky when he was running the Essendine Institute in London. Um, I was studying uh, art and art history in London at the, top, at the same time as going to his lessons, his practical lessons, and also developed a parallel interest in Eastern in Orthodox theology and began it, reading people like uh, Vladimir Roski in particular and just developed uh, an all abiding and continuing interest in theological art of, of all traditions. And I've more recently been doing a lot of personal research, kind of um, uh, forensic iconography, if you would, looking at um, the Western tradition, particularly the Romanesque. Uh, and also more recently Italo-Byzantine connections and also uh, trying to put those into churches, trying to make new art in the old style for West, contemporary Western churches. So Peter, really what the, the four of us are involved as contemporary iconographers were painting commissions for serious places and contexts with different backgrounds and experiences. Aidan as an Orthodox, Stefan as, uh, as a Copt, yourself as a, as a Catholic, all trying to sort of unpack, to explore, to, to allow the tradition to come to life in the context that we're working in. I think we're all creative people, we're not slavish copiers. So I think what, what would be really quite fascinating is to see how, given these different backgrounds that were coming from and insights. I mean, Peter, perhaps you could put it in the context of what happened in Italy, you know, that sort of mm. where Byzantium met the West and there was this very fertile, rich creativity at that time. So but could I hand over to you for that? Well, of course, in the, uh, in the early days, the, you know, the, the church was one. And in, in Italy, you know, uh, there were two capitals. There was Rome and there was Constantinople. Unfortunately, there's a, there have been a lot of survivals in Italy. Uh, it's, it's often, in, in Italy, you didn't have a reformation, but you had a renaissance that almost did as much damage to Byzantine art as the reformation did in, in Northern Europe. I, I take my students on tours of churches in Rome, which I jokingly refer to as beyond the Baldacchino. So if you can, if you can get past 
because there's a jump in Rome as well. There's a jump from early art to high renaissance and baroque. So often in churches, like in church, a great church as a kind of um, a one-stop case study would be the church of uh, Santa Maria in Trastavere in Rome, where, where you find beyond the Baldacchino, exquisite early Byzantine mosaics. And then the next layer down, superb Italo-Byzantine mosaics. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a, you can see that it's a continuing tradition. But, it, but in um, all over Italy, you find these things. There's a, there's a terrific collection of Italo-Byzantine crosses in the museum in Pisa, in the Museum San Matteo in Pisa, which is a particularly Western iconographic um, thing, the great hanging, free hanging apse cross that you get, you know, the San Damiano, the cross that spoke to yeah. St. Francis. And there are hundreds of these all over Italy. Um, and they, they are an incredibly valuable tool for finding prototypes for doing things like uh, the uh, cross I did recently for a Catholic church in, in uh, Reading. And I'm sure you found things like that very valuable when you were doing the, the big Litchfield cross here. Sure, yeah. Um, and, and I've seen versions that Aidan has done, the double-sided crosses as well. So. There are connections like like that that in the West later on, as as the two traditions separated, um, and you have you have the, the great the great schism. It wasn't it wasn't a clean break, and artistically, Italians painted like Byzantine iconographers for another two or three hundred years, and you get um, interesting um, um, missing links if you like. You get things like um, the um, the Perugia triptych, which is a terrific example. It, it's a Western iconostasis. It, it has an it's two meters tall. You know, it's as big as a an iconostasis. It has the enthroned Mother of God with the Christ Child in the center, and on the wings, it has all of the feasts, all of the feasts of the church. So it's. It's an iconostasis for a different liturgical tradition. Um, and those are the sorts of things that I'm particularly interested in. Um, I think it's quite difficult to say, you know, when things are and aren't icons. I mean, the, the Western spiritual tradition, Western religious sacred art continued to develop. Um, and But I, I, I think there's a, there's a sweet spot, if you like, between the years 1200 and 1300 in the West, when you have people like Cavallini in, in, in Rome um, and Copa di Marcovado in Tuscany. There's a sweet spot where there is an Italian painting style, which is totally Byzantine. Right. And I, I joke, I, it's a kind of serious joke that I have with some of my students. I say I, I could fresco an orthodox cathedral using only prototypes painted by Italians between 12 and 1300. And that's the sort of thing that in the West, we have this broken, this discontinued tradition, this stuttering tradition, and we haven't really got the fully developed theology of, of um, salvation by art that the sure. East, that the orthodox, the Aden's tradition has. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's something that we can really learn from. Something, I mean, that, that, that strikes me, I mean, Stefan, the Coptic tradition um, in, in, in terms of iconography, distinctive really from the Byzantine, and again, suffering from schism in the same way that the West separated from the East. And I know from, from a, a little bit that I've heard that um, it's been quite a challenge for people inspired by Dr. Fanous to really challenge some of that westernized style of art within the church. Perhaps you could come in, building on what Peter had said, to, 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 to recontextualize in, in, in your own situation. Well, going on from what Peter um, just discussed, the, there is um, the, the, the the tradition of, say, Christ Pantocrator in the niche, hmm, 
you can yeah. see you can see it where obviously one of the one of the earliest ones is in Santa Maria de Maggiore, I think, in uh, in, in in Italy, and um, you know it shows Christ, but not in the not in the ellipse or in the vesica, but but with the four uh, living creatures. That's one of the earliest uh, of this type, um, I think. But then within few years we're talking here about four 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 hundred hmm? in saint, uh, saint maria maggiore so so by so which shows that by the by the council of chalcedon there was already a, a, an established canon um then then by the fifth sixth century now you see these pantocrators in egypt hmm? and and what I find very interesting is, is, is that this, um, the Pantocrator uh, doesn't change very much over until about 1200 or so. Mm. Mm. And you see it all over Europe, right? You, you see it in Italy, you see it in Romanesque art, right? You see, you see it in England, in, in Germany, um, and of course on the on the front porches of the of the great cathedrals, and so on. So, so we see there's a continuity there, and uh, even though even though Egypt was already under Islamic domination by the seventh century, we can we, we, we can see that there there was there was uh, some sort of um, uh, harmony uh, um, that goes to Spain and, and and Europe and so on. So. Now, the crunch really in Egypt, the crunch comes around the 18th century when Western missionaries begin to, to oh. um, flood the place. Mm? Right. And, and, uh, and, and, and their, their, um, their work was really to, to convert the Copts. Mm? And there was some kind of agreement between them between the missionaries and the Khedive at the time, I think was uh, Ismail, Ismail Mohammed, Ismail Mohammed. Um, I may be wrong there, but maybe his, his, his father, and I'm, I'm not, I can't remember offhand. So. But anyway, around then, around that time, that they should concentrate only on the Christians, that they shouldn't even try to convert the Muslims. So, so they gave, you know, he gave them land to build uh, their churches and their schools. And it's really through the school, you know, through the schooling system that, um, that the, um, you know, the, the, that Coptic culture really was very much affected, very much affected. Of course, the, the, West, the, the Western missionaries considered the Copts as, you know, sort of uh, backward, basically. Sort of almost pagan, right? Mm. Um, and 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 so they they really did a, a thorough job, I must say. I mean, um, you know, so so the the music survived. Coptic music su survived more or less, more or less um, unchanged. Uh, but the art didn't survive at all. And and it's very interesting to see that ar from around that period, you have all the the five. Uh, Non-Chalcedonian churches were very much attacked by the uh, by these um, missionaries. Mm. So you have, you know, in India, it's exactly the same thing. Um, in, uh, of course, Armenia, Syria, right? Only the Ethiopians, sort of, more or less, until now. Though a lot of, you know, Ethiopian art now is really touristic and and and. Um, but but uh, it has survived in Ethiopia a lot uh, a lot better than in Egypt for sure. Hmm. So by the time we reach the 19th century, uh, iconography is dead basically in Egypt until the coming of Isaac Fanus in the in the mid 50s. Okay, um, and even in the mid 50s, although there, there was this this conscious will to rediscover um, the Coptic tradition by the Copts themselves, hence the, the opening of the, um, 
uh, Coptic Institute of, um, of, of Studies um, in 1954. Um, Fanus was actually one of the first um, uh, students there and eventually, you know, for many years, for, for about five or six, seven years, they run around, you know, like, like a dog after their, their own tail, because <laughs> what should this new Coptic art look like, right? Where, and and what, are the, what were the techniques used, right? And, and what was the symbolism? and so on and so forth. So all these, all these questions came up, uh, and it's, it's only by going to Paris um, while uh, at Le Louvre, st studying restoration, actually, on a, on a grant from the, from the Royal Council of Churches. And it was then that he met um, Leonid Ospensky and uh, Paul Evdikimov, and basically all the, you know, the school of Paris, as it's known now. Uh, at l'Institut Saint-Serge. And, and so only then was he able to, in a way, revive um, uh, the Coptic tradition. And he said to Ospensky when he left that, uh, because Ospensky wanted him to stay and teach there, uh, but he said, no, 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 I'm, I'm going back. I'm going back to my people. I'm going back to my church. My church needs me, and, and I don't want to paint Russian icons in Egypt. I, 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 you know, my work is really to, to revive the Coptic tradition. And um, <clears throat> so that is how it happened. So obviously the Russians gave him the tools necessary to, to do this um, amazing work, uh, actually, because, you know, he had to really re, re, you know, reconstruct a canon of proportion and so on. But, you know, as he said, he used to say, I, you know, I built a bridge between Bawit, which is the sixth century, um, uh, um, Coptic Egypt and today. So, but this bridge was not really stylistic in a way. It was not about style as such. It was more about the, the proportions, right? And reestablishing this um, idea of, of, of proportion, which you find, interestingly enough, I mean, in my own research, <coughs> when you look at, say, you know, the the famous niche of Bawit with, with Christ, uh, Pantocrator, and, and, and the apostles underneath and Theotokos in the middle. You find that it is, you know, the rhythm and so on can only be achieved with, with this idea of proportion. Okay. It creates rhythm, it creates, uh, you know, harmony. Um, and so when we, when, uh, so basically, in a nutshell, this is quite a long story, but in a, in a nutshell, today we find uh, probably 90% of Coptic Orthodox churches covered in pseudo-Roman, uh, you know, high Renaissance type thing, mm. uh, type art, which, which is really astounding. I mean, you know, they had, they had you know, even, even the Catholics rejected. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And um, so, you know, I created a blog to deal with these issues. And so, you know, I, I've been writing about these issues um, to basically aimed at, at the cops, you know, to try and, and you know, untangle this, this whole thing, which, you know, which has become now really like a cultural, has become like a cultural issue, uh, an issue of identity, you know, um, and then the most important, of, obviously, an issue of theology, right? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, and um, because, you know, what is liturgical art and what is, just, you know, what, what is religious art? You know, what is the difference between the two and so on and so forth? So all these questions are, are being brought up now. And, um, yeah, it's, it's <coughs> a, on, on, you know, it's very sad on one hand, uh, but there is hope on the other. But... Um, so I will leave the, the space yeah. for the speaker. Thanks, Can I, I mean, for a second there. Pardon? Can I just say something for a second? Yes, yeah, I mean, Peter. In, um, in 1982, I wrote to Leonid Spensky in Paris. I was hoping to go and study with him, but he was about, he was retiring. He wasn't going to teach anymore. And he sent me a long letter saying that as a Western iconographer, 
what I needed to do was exactly what you were saying. He said, you look to your tradition, look to the Romanesque and develop that. Make, make an iconography from that tradition and look at it yes. because it's there. Yes, 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 yes. Well, that, yeah, that goes exactly hand in hand with, with what happened with Isaac Fanus. Um, you know, so, so, yeah, yeah. He did a lot of important work. Although I, I, I'm, uh, I'm aware that there are, there are people today who, um, who, you know, began to criticize Ospensky and, you know, the School of Paris in general. Um, and I can well, understand... Thank you, Stefan. I think before we, we, we branch maybe into something a little bit more critical, I'd like to bring Aidan in. Yes. Um, because I think that's, this is quite a, a neat place to, to transition over because obviously um, this thing that you brought up about identity and culture. Yes. Um, I mean, Aidan, you're orthodox in England, which to some people seems a natural thing, but for other people seems like a real cultural clash you know how how can you be orthodox which is greek or russian or bulgarian or something like that in shropshire um and i know that you've explored a lot about this interface as an orthodox icon painter here in english so maybe this sort of struggle for identity struggle against this corruption of the renaissance which seemed to be a common theme and then something about how that struggle is sort of manifesting itself in your own contemporary context. Yes. yes, I thought the best way to answer that might be to talk a bit about the process that I would go through for filling a commission, not so much a private one, but more of a church one, because I think that as it were incarnates the, uh, the principles that I apply. Yeah. Um, so I might look first at the architecture of the building, and because a lot of the buildings in, in England, Orthodox ones included, tend to be um, Gothic, Neo-Gothic, or perhaps Saxon in some cases, I think the iconography has got to, as much as possible, relate to its context. So, for example, I, I did an icon for the Gabriel Chapel at um, Canterbury Cathedral, and that chapel happened to have Romanesque frescoes, so it was natural then to do an icon that um, was, was Romanesque. I see um, Peter nodding very emphatically yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but more excitingly, recently I've been um, asked to be like a consultant and actually make quite a bit of work for a brand new church in Montana. So there's a lot of timber in Montana in America, so they're going to make basically a half-timbered church. So I'm working closely there with um, the architects and the makers, as it were, to help them think from the inside out, because often architectural maker a church, and then the iconographers are left to sort of stuff <laughs> icons into the yeah. space that they're very kindly left over, most mm. of which don't work. So <laughs> that's been very interesting. Um, secondly, the historical context. Um, so the church that I go to in Shrewsbury is uh, in its present state a 13th century church and has frescoes, quite crude ones, but frescoes nonetheless from about 1380. Um, so the icons I do for that have got to relate to that. Um, historical context. Um, the third thing would be the pastoral and missionary need. Um, uh, I was commissioned by the Anglican Bishop of Warwick to do a large icon of the Transfiguration, which he was going to use really to teach in a prayer, the Jesus prayer. So in that case, he really wanted the rocks to have importance. In other words, um, through the life in the desert of the heart, as it were, that alone with God, we can experience um, the transfigured light. So he, in that case, you know, he, he, we actually about a third of the icon was the rocks. Um, so that was a response to that. Whereas other commissions, the pastoral context would require a closer contact between the three disciples and Christ. So um, I've probably done about 10 icons of the transfiguration and each is a response to a particular need. Um, uh, fourth, the input from commissioners. Um, that's quite, quite important. Um, uh, what's an example of that? Uh, yes, I did a large transfiguration uh, wall painting for the Catholic Church and Lancaster University. Uh, this was a bit unusual in that it had it was actually landscape rather than um, a vertical portrait commission. 
and the, the priest there is a great theologian, so we had a lot of talks about what he wanted in this. And one thing that arose was, uh, because these figures were going to be so big, um, probably about 10 feet high, we didn't want the congregation, many students, to feel sort of overwhelmed by these tall figures. So I designed it so that as you went to the edge, and in this case, because of the landscape orientation, we couldn't have the normal setup. We have Christ, Moses, and Elijah on the top, and the three disciples below, they all had to be in a row. So to stop the figures on the end, um, sort of overwhelming those sitting nearby, I had them kneeling down. So basically you started with Christ the highest in the middle and then went down. So by the time you got to the end, the scale there was, was more on the scale of the congregation, as it were. So a lot of that came out of conversation with, with, with the priest. Um, another element that I take into consideration is my own personal interests. And one thing I feel strongly about at the moment is that I think female saints in particular have suffered from basically box standard faces <laughs> with a different name on. But my experience of, of, of knowing some living saints, Father Sophroni, Father Paisius, and I met Saint um, Porphyrius uh, once as well, is that each of these saints is unique and different. So it struck me that their purity didn't make them all the same. Their purity obviously purged them of egotism but it also brought out their unique name, as it were. Mm. So in that case, I've been drawing on early Roman work, um, like you, Peter, going to Rome and looking at the mosaics, uh, and also to Ravenna, uh, and also looking at the mosaics in Thessaloniki, where I lived for a year, and the Rotonda. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, amazing, aren't they? Yeah. Super. It struck me as how unique those faces are, especially in the Rotonda. Yeah, yeah, these yeah. are real people. They're not naturalistic, but they are real people. Yeah. So um, you can probably see behind me an icon I'm working on at the moment of an early Irish saint, and I'm drawing on some of those, um, actually, Fayum portraits as well. I'm not copying mm -hmm. the Fayum portraits, but I'm using those as a sort of a starting point, how to uh, rediscover some of that uniqueness. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit of a balancing act because you don't want to go to straight naturalism, but on the other hand, I don't want to go to sort of bog standard faces. Mm -hmm. um, Aiden, can I just yeah. probe you on that one? Because, I mean, this is sort of a quite a crux thing, I think, for a lot of people seeking inspiration is you've gone outside of the iconographic tradition, Fayum being non-Christian, really, um, secular at least, um, maybe pagan, and <laughs> felt comfortable going to that tradition um, why? How does that work? Take us on take us on the inside of that. I wouldn't say that I'm using the fine portraits as a basis for icons so much. It's just um, sometimes when you go one way, you need an extreme, as it were, to find the, the, the middle way. So in fact, my influence is probably more from some of these mosaics from the Rotonda, which mm. and of course the, the well-known um, Sinai icons, encaustic ones, which are definitely inspired by the Fayum. But some medical changes, like most of the Fayum ones, um, they look more to the side, there is more naturalism. Um, but I'm interested in the, in the early church, the so-called time of the apologists, because here Christianity was the minority, um, uh, Greek philosophy and Greek art, Greek Roman art, was the majority. So the church there had to respond to that and find what was good in it, transform it where necessary. They didn't take it lock, stock and barrel. Some things had to be rejected and put aside. And in some ways, I think we're in the same ethos now. You know, we're a minority. We're in a culture that's been influenced, of course, and based on Christianity, but it's become so secularized. But there's a lot of good stuff there as well. So I think, as well as going back to the Romanesque and, and drawing that forward, I, I, I do feel um, we're in a really quite creative stage at the moment. And I think there are dangers in that. I think we really need to be profoundly grounded in theology um, so we know what to take and what not to, grounded in the spiritual life of the church. Because I think, often time as students, you've got to have the music of heaven in your soul so that when you're painting or carving, what are you doing? You can sense that something's out of tune with that inner music. So yeah. you can say, oh, no, that doesn't work. That's dissonant with the life of, of the Holy Spirit and the church. But it's and also, this obviously it's mental. Sorry, Peter. So it's also true transfiguration, because if you go to somewhere using, again, Rome as an example, if you go to Santa Pudenziana, then you, you, the, the apse mosaic there 
uh, which is very, very early, fourth century. It's, it, oh, that's, it's, that's the one I, that's the one I, sorry, that's the one I meant uh, earlier on. It's yes. Jove and the Senators. You know, it's yeah. Jove and the Senators, but it's also Parousius, the second coming. Yeah. So it's you know, taking the tools you have and transforming, okay. making it into something that, that, that is, um, you know, transforming for you, the maker, and for participants in, in the liturgy in that church, taking what they recognize and making it something truly uh, uh, transfigurational, transformative. Perhaps then um, to, to pull this together, I think we've got to quite an interesting place. And the question I'd like to now ask is, okay, so we've got these struggles with culture, um, struggles with context, both in the past and especially today. Um, and there are some pretty horrendous examples of some people playing with iconography okay. um, and ending up with, I don't know, Martin Luther King painted in the style of uh, an icon, for, for example, and how you deal with that. I think if we could sort of discuss between the three of you how, how your work is pushing forward, given the challenges that we've, we've been looking at. Um, and, you know, we'll run with that and see where... where...